Well, brothers and sisters, as our friend of peace says here, a deputation for Bethel to the priests in Jerusalem. And you'll see up there, of course, the, the, the map, the... Uh, which way that goes? Yes, the, the map the up there, and you'll see a little arrow if you can see that from Bethel to Jerusalem, about 25, 30 kilometres apart. And those men came down from Bethel to Jerusalem. Now, when we read that record, of course, it says nothing about Bethel, did it? How do we know there was Bethel? Well, you see, it says in verses 1 and 2 And it came to pass in the fourth year of King Darius, and the word of Yahweh came unto Zechariah in the fourth day of the month, even Chislu when they had sent unto the house of God. Now, that's not right. Uh, the house of God is a translation of the, of the name Bethel. It means the house of God. And it's a proper name. And nearly all the reliable translations change that. And so the RSV says, Now the people of Bethel had sent. So that's what it really means. So that this deputation is coming down and they're going to talk to the priests and they want, they want an answer from Yahweh. And by the way, brothers and sisters, they finally get their answer at the end of chapter 8, by the way. You get two full chapters before Yahweh actually answers their question. But they're going to come down, they want to find out about whether they should keep these, these fasts they've been keeping for 70 years, seeing that they're back in the land, uh, they're established there, and the temple is in progress. They feel the time has come uh, when they're not going to have to do those fasts any longer. Now, brothers and sisters, it's not without significance. You see, when you read the Bible, you've got to put everything in context. And it's not without significance that chapter 6, at the, end of, at the latter part of chapter 6, we learned about three other men coming, didn't we? Of Hildiah, to Tobijah, and Jedi, not Jediiah. They all came, and they'd just returned, not from Bethel. They'd come back from Babylon just recently, just arrived. And Yahweh answered immediately uh, what these men were on about. He, he, he doesn't delay as he does here. And he says to, to, the prophet, to the people, to Joshua, accept these people, accept them, no questions asked. And their names were very significant. Of the world. But Yahweh is good and he knows. And these obviously represented people of the world. Yahweh knows them and he's good. And he said, then you're going to accept these people. Not only that, but they brought gifts of gold and silver and that got rendered down and made crowns and those, some of those crowns were stored away for those people and they're called memorial crowns and, and they, are, they are for Heldiah, Tobijah and Jediah. They're for those three men and they were symbolised, brothers and sisters, that one day those three men will wear a crown of righteousness that doesn't ever fade away. Now, it's not without significance that this crowd comes down in chapter 7 with a vastly different reception from Yahweh. And they don't get an answer until the end of chapter 8, because chapter 7 and 8 is about the same thing, as we will see as we proceed. So you see, it's extremely interesting, brothers and sisters, uh, to see that. So these people came down. Now, there, of course, is the, the map. You might not actually see Bethel there. You might see it a bit clearer here. But Bethel, you see, whoop, whoop, let's go back. Bethel was on the, on the border there. Like that should put a ring out there. It doesn't. What's going wrong? There should be a ring around there showing that Bethel's on the border between Israel and Judah. You can see how strategic that was. So there's Bethel, brothers and sisters, perched on the border of Judah and Israel. Now, Ezra chapter 2, verse 28 says, there were 223 men of Bethel who had a t return with the original group that came first of all out of Babylon. They came some time before those other three men, of course, we learned about in chapter 6. So 223 of them are already back in the land. And they come from Bethel. Now let's have a look at the history of Bethel. Hey, there's something very wrong here. This is not working. Can someone help me out with this thing? Because this is just not working properly here. That's going all right. Ah, that's better. Ah, here we are. Didn't press it hard enough. I thought it wasn't working. Right. Now, here's the checkered history of Bethel. Just, just watch this history, because this, this, is, this is important. Abraham came here first after receiving the promise. Of course, it was famous for the scene of the vision of Jacob's ladder when Jacob was sent off to his uncle Laban's place to find himself a wife. And he, of course, lay down at Bethel and he appeared, a staircase appeared from him from heaven 
And the angels, God, were ascending and descending upon him. They weren't descending and ascending. They were ascending first and then descending. In other words, they were with him in the beginning and they were with him at the end. And Yahweh said, I will be with you everywhere you go. That was the significance of that tremendous vision. A wonderful significance. That happened at Bethel. Jacob's name was changed there when he came back to Bethel. Matter of fact, it, it, it had a little title put before it. It no longer was known in his mind as merely Bethel, the house of God, but Ael, Beth Ael. He saw it as the strength of the house of God. Because he saw now it had a great significance for him when he saw that that staircase indicating God's providence had been certainly carried out in most trying times with his uncle. Now it changes. It's there in Bethel that Jeroboam put his golden calf. You can see what he was, why he did that. You see, he planted one golden calf at Bethel right on the border with Judah and the other one right up under Mount Hermon so he covered the extremity of north and south. He wanted all the people kept up in the north and, and they all went up there to the north and worshipped the golden calf right up there under Hermon at, in, at the place of Dan. The other one he put on that border there, just in case anyone would want to go down the south and join their brethren, then they would stop at that border and there was one of his golden calves to worship there. He had it all covered. And that's why he put one right on that border there at Bethel. It was in that place, brothers and sisters, that the Jewish priest not priests, just one Jewish priest was sent back by the Assyrians to teach the, C the Samaritans the religion of Israel. It was right there that that Jewish priest taught the religion to those mixed race of people. Five, they worshipped five gods and they'd all came back from various areas east of, of course, of, of, uh, over there by the Euphrates from a very superstitious area. They'd all came back and there was lions everywhere because with the removal of the population of the north by the Assyrians in 721 BC, and by the time they'd populated again with this rabble from all over the, the, the east and over there, the lions had proliferated and they became a menace. So they said, oh, we want to know about the God of the land. We want to know about the God of the land. This is why we're suffering from all these lions. So they asked the uh, Shalmanes to send one Jewish priest, and he did. And he taught the people, the religion of Israel, in that place. And it says, they believed in Yahweh, but they went on worshipping their own gods, five others. And so they became a hodgepodge of a religion of which Jesus said to the woman of Samaria, ye worship, ye know not what. They had all mixed up. So that happened at Bethel. Started at Bethel. It became a centre of idolatry. Amos is, we'll see later on what that chapter of Amos is about. And finally, it got called Beth Aben, the house of vanity. Hebrew word means nothingness. It became the house of nothingness. So instead of being the house of God, brothers and sisters, it became the house of nothing because it got all fouled up. As time went on, and as Jeroboam planted his golden calf there, and from thence, brothers and sisters, it was all a downhill run. This is where that Bethel, that deputation had come from. All right, they'd been 70 years in captivity. But we're going to see, brothers and sisters, that they'd learnt nothing. And they came back with a question full of obvious, that is, outward show of deep sincerity and they get a very very sharp rebuke and they've got to wait for many of these verses to go past before they get their answer to their question it's very well intriguing the way this is done so these these men that came down from bethel were really contrasted to those who had come down from the uh, from babylon to join their compatriots in the land now a bit of history so we get the time right BC 587 was the fall of Jerusalem. Okay. Now in BC 518, this is when the visit of the delegation from Bethel came in the fourth year of Darius. That's two years. Two years from the commencement of the temple. So you see, 
They're all eager and enthusiastic now because the temple is underway, it's under construction. Another two years it's finished. And at any rate, they, they, they're here there now and they're two years from the time that started and they're all enthusiastic and they think, well, everything's going well. We, we're wasting our time with all these fasts. We, we, we better go and find out what we should be doing because we, 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 we can't be mourning anymore because this is a time of rejoicing and rebuilding and we're all part of the scheme. That was what they thought. The 69 years from the fall of Jerusalem when this took place. Okay, so there were 70 years in captivity. That's right. But there were two lots of 70 years. 70 years of captivity, yes, but 70 years of the desolation of the temple. They, went, they started at different dates and finished at different dates. So there was one more year before the 70th year came after the fall of Jerusalem, which would end that period. So they were in sight of a celebration of the fulfilment of Yahweh's word. And they were full of excitement and they felt that they were going to be part of it. They had a lot to learn. And there's a great deal for us to learn about this in this, brothers and sisters, is also by BC 516, two years later, the completion of the rebuilding of the temple in the sixth year of Darius, two years later. So you see, that was the time period. That, that's the, the sort of the, the background of this. That, that's the, 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 the psychology of this visit. That, that's what they come for. So you can see what they are thinking and how they're going to be full of confidence that now it's all going to be different and they're going to find, of course, that they're on the, on the way up. Well, we'll see. Now, here are the divisions of Zechariah 7 and 8 in a broad way. We'll deal with them as we deal with each separate chapter. We'll deal with them in a bit more detail. But broadly speaking, they go like this. The divisions are prefaced with, then the word of Yahweh came or the word of Yahweh of hosts came. So there's a lot of that in these, in these divisions. You read that time and again. So we read, then the word of Yahweh came, and then the word of Yahweh of armies came. So you can see what's happening. It's like this discussion going on, and this little group of people are asking the priest, and Yahweh says, I want to say this, and I want to say that, and I want to say this, and I want to say that. The word of Yahweh is coming in rapid succession, but they're not getting their answer immediately. The deputation from Bethel questions as to questioning as whether they should continue the fast in view of the return of the land. That's how they thought, thought, felt. That was their, their attitude. Chapter 7, verses 4 to 7, Yahweh questions their motive for keeping the feast themselves during those 70 years of captivity. He questions their motive. You know, brothers and sisters, you're sitting there. Are you thinking what I'm thinking when I did this? This is us. Hopefully a bit better than this. We're not far from the return of Christ, are we? We've been, most of us, nearly all of us, I suppose, as we're not of Israel, we've been called out of the world. We came out of the world. We hope we're among the, the, the group represented by Hildea. But we know that Yahweh is good, and we hope that he knows us. But because it's far more important that God knows us than we know him. Paul said that in the Galatian epistle. Now that you've known of God, he said, or rather, known of God. And we know, brothers and sisters, that the signs of the times are that Jerusalem's captivity to the world is about to end. There's going to be another temple built very shortly. We're on the edge of destiny, brothers and sisters. And we ask questions of Yahweh in our prayers. When, Yahweh, when will this happen? Why should I be doing this? Why should I be doing that? Or what should I be doing? Or what should I not be doing? We, hear, we get nothing, brother. We hear nothing. Silence. But we're going to hear it one day very clearly, and we hope it'll be positive. So when we go through this, there are two groups to think about, isn't there? One in chapter 6 and one in chapter 7. And we hope we're among those in chapter 6, who Yahweh said, accept them. That's what he said. Now here, these people, the first thing that we get told is, I've got to question your motive. That, you see, that's important, isn't it, brothers and sisters? See, many of us will go to the judgment seat with a long history in the truth. Come June 23 this year, that'll be my 60th year in the truth, right? I had a long history in the truth. Done a lot of speaking everywhere. Won't mean a thing if my motive is not correct. That's the thing that's going to count. 
You, you can, your motives are difficult to control sometimes. You, you do things because, uh, well, you do it because you get praised by people for doing it or whatever. But that's the thing that's going to get questioned. And that's the first thing they got questioned about. He then reveals their hypocrisy. They were hypocrites. And they didn't know they were hypocrites. That's the tragedy. Chapter 8, we get into chapter 8. Yahweh says he, he himself, will reverse the fortunes of Jerusalem when the nation learns to obey him. He says, I'll reverse your fortunes when you obey me. Well, they were under the impression that they were already doing that. But they weren't. He's going to remind them of that. We'll, we'll get a little bit more detail of those divisions when we get to chapter 8. And then at the end of chapter 8, Yahweh will turn their feasts of mourning into feasts of joy and gladness. But there's a condition before that will happen. He lays down the condition which leads to that. And it's not till right to that chapter, chapter 8, at the end of that chapter, that they finally get their answer as to whether they should or whether they shouldn't keep those feasts as they've been doing, as they thought, for 70 odd years. Now when we come into the chapter then, we learn about the, these chaps in verse 2. It says, and this I read now for the RSV, the RSV says, Now when the people of Bethel had sent Shereza and Regem Melek. Now there's the, there's the two representatives of this group. Now Shereza, we don't know what it means, there's no... Strong's knows nothing about it. it it's uh, an Assyrian name, brothers and sisters. Isn't that interesting? It's an Assyrian name. And the only time we ever find that name, again, in the Bible, is the name of one of the brothers, an Assyrian, that when, you remember when uh, Shalmaneser came down and he, he, he sacked uh, uh, Jerusalem, or tried to, and he, and he surrounded Jerusalem, Sennacherib surrounded Jerusalem with his army there, and Yahweh slew 185,000 of them, and then they all got straggled back to the land, limping and very wounded, of course, from the blow. They, they got a massive blow. They went back and they hardly got back there. But then Jalmanizer was killed in that temple by his own boy called Shereza. That's the only time we read about that name. So that we know nothing about him except his name's linked somehow with that. Nowhere else do we find that name. Regem Melek, brothers and sisters, Relem Melix means the king's stone. The king's stone. And, and one wonders whether that's got a connection. I don't know. I'm not saying it has. Whether that's got some connection with a very important pillar that's in Bethel. That was in Bethel at that time. A historic pillar that Jacob set up to say, this is the house of God, Bethel. This is the gateway to heaven when he saw those angels coming and go, going and coming to him. Whether or not that has any influence upon this fellow uh, to call that place the king's stone, I don't know. But it could have. And the, they came, it says in verse 2, to pray before Yahweh. Now the word means to entreat. And, and the very word itself, brothers and sisters, is a word is used almost in every context of a very humble approach. So these people had every outward show of being genuine. They'd fasted for 70 years. They'd done that religiously. They'd come down there from this most important place. They want to know the answer to a question. They're looking forward to the future. The temple's being built and they're very sincere and they beseech Yahweh. They say, now look, verse 3. They said, tell us. And speak unto the priests, which were in the house of Yahweh of armies, and to the prophets, saying, Should I weep in the fifth month, separating myself as I have done so many years? See how many years I've done this. I've done it for so long. Now, they only mentioned one feast, one, one, one fast that, that Israel were practicing in that time. But. Yahweh's initial response to that is going to see he mentions another one. Now let's have a look at all the fasts. They're all, all listed in chapter 8 and verse 19. And this is why they were fasting in those 70 years. In the fourth month, they were fasting every fourth month of the year and it recalls the breaching of the walls by Nebuchadnezzar in the 11th year of Zedekiah. 
these references there, the proof of that. Then there was this one they talked about, the fifth month, which recalls the destruction of the city and the temple. That's the next one. Then we got this one. Recalls the revolt of Gedaliah. Well, not Gedaliah. Gedaliah was the one that, oh, I've got this wrong name there. The, uh, the, 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 the fellow that killed him, uh, my memory is dreadful. Um, Ishmael. Pardon? Ishmael. Ishmael, of course. Oh, yeah. Ish Gedaliah was the one that was killed. The revolt of Ishmael in the 19th year of Nebuchadnezzar and the subsequent departure of the remnant into Egypt. That was celebrating, celebrated in the seventh month. And then finally, in the tenth month, this one recalls the beginning of the siege in the year of Zedekiah. Now, now they're, they're the, 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 the four fast brothers and sisters that Israel practised religiously for those 70 years when they, when they were recalling the dreadful destruction of Jerusalem and all the misery that caused and they would hang their heads and they would weep and they would put sackcloth and ashes on and make wailing and weeping and so on and they did that for 70 years and they said... We've done this for so long. How long do we got to go on with this? How long do we got to go on with that? We've done this for so long. That's what they said. Well, in chapter 7 and verse 5, Yahweh commences to answer them. He doesn't give them their final answer till the end of chapter 8. And he said to these men of Bethel, in verse 5, Speak unto all the people of the land. Ah, oh, so these didn't just represent Bethel. Yahweh looked at this crowd and he said, right, I want to speak to you, all the people. That's who you represent, isn't it? You're coming here, it's not just you, but you've come from this centre to, to, to ask me these questions. And he said, I want to know, he said, that what have all the people have been doing? What have they all been doing? And he questions them now about their motive, brothers and sisters, and that goes down to verse 7. Now he says here, in this verse, he says, When you fasted and mourned in the fifth and the seventh month, they never asked the question about the seventh month. I'll tell you why Yahweh did. Even in all those years, did you at all fast even to me? Now, brothers and sisters, can you imagine the impact of that upon that crowd? What, what if you and I turned up at that judgment seat and we pleaded with our Lord Jesus Christ if he showed any signs of disfavour. Lord, I've, I've been 60 years in the truth. 60 years of my life. I was only in my teens when I first learned about it in the early 20s when I accepted it. 60 odd years, Lord. And I prayed constantly unto you. What would we think, brothers and sisters, if he said, did you pray to me? I wasn't aware. Can you imagine that? 70 years, these people. And Yahweh said, is that what you did? I wasn't aware of that. Can you imagine the impact of that upon those people? Just try and think that through. That would be shattering to get a comment like that. When you think back of all the times in those four times a year that you did that, gathered with your people together, put on sackcloth and ashes, went without your food and drink, denied yourself the pleasures of life and so forth and laid in bulrushes and ashes and bowed your head to the earth for 70 years and Yahweh said, I was not aware of it. Did you do that? Amazing. Absolutely amazing. You see, brothers and sisters, all their fasts were to make a great show. You turn to Matthew chapter 6. This is what it was about. You see, it was all put on for show. It, 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 was a, it was a show to their fellow men. Their fellow men was what they, they were showing. Their, their, their heart was not with Yahweh. This was all a demonstration of how wonderful they were in front of their fellow man. And Jesus made a point of this in Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount at verse 16. He says, Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Now we've got uh, authorities which tell us about the custom of the times, what they used to do. Uh, that, they, that they would pack their, their little bonnets with, with, with a, a mixture of oil and ashes 
and plaster it on their heads so that the heat of their body would, would, would cause that oil to become thinner and it would run down in streams over their face and what it would do, it would leave streaks of ashes down here. So they would run around making sure that everybody could see their face. Look at me. Look at me. Aren't I, I a picture of misery? My word, I must have a very wonderful heart. Fancy me going through all of this. Look at those, that ashes running down my face. You imagine that. And Yahweh said, was that to me? I never knew that. Boy, you imagine that. You know, I read that my blood ran cold. I think, how, how would you be? After all the years that some of us have been in the truth, if you find that God, you might think you know God, but he doesn't know you. That, you know, as Paul says, it's far more important that he knows us than we know him. I mean, of course, God couldn't know us unless we knew him, but it's far more important that he knows us. That's why one of those men uh, that came back from, from Babylon says, Yahweh knows. Accept them. But this crowd, he said, I don't know you. Now, now that, that, that's extremely interesting. And you know, brothers and sisters, when you turn to Isaiah 58, now you look, you look what happened here. We know this reference is a well-known reference, but you, let's read it together. Here, here's the, here's the, what they should have been doing. You see, their fasts, brothers and sisters, were nothing more than an orgy of self-pity. Now, we all love to pity ourselves. We, we love to do that. Some people don't. They're, they're stoical. Others are not. But we do love to pity ourselves. Their fasts were nothing else but an orgy of self-pity. And here's, the, here's the, the point. Why are they fasting? Because of all the desolations that have come upon them. So they go to the fast, they, they get dressed accordingly and put on their ash, sackcloth and so forth, put their ashes up here and let it run down their face and look miserable, brothers and sisters, because they're going to confess to God, they're going to confess to God that because of our sins this happened. Well, why do you need to ask the question as to what you have to do for the fast to stop? The, the answer's here. Listen to it. You see, verse 3 of Isaiah 58. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and, see, and thou seest not? This was exactly the case of these men. Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge of it? You don't know we've done that. Behold, in the day of your fast, says Yahweh, you find pleasure. And exact all your labours. You get the most out of what you're suffering. You're doing it for show. You, you want to be patted on the back. You want to be thought to be a wonderful, a holy person with a great and a tremendous motive. That's what you do. That's why, that's why I don't know anything about it. I didn't take any notice of it. He says, Behold, ye fast for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness. You see, brothers and sisters, that there would be such competition between these people and the Pharisees of Jesus' day that it had turned into a fight. It turned into a fist fight as to who was doing it best. Think of that. They got into arguments, a debate about it. One fellow says, look at my garment, it's all torn and tattered, yours is pretty, look, looking pretty good. Oh, oh, you know, you should be dressed up a bit more shabbily because it shows how, how mournful you are. Oh, you can't talk to me like that. And there's a fight over as to who is best at fasting. And they're coming to Yahweh and say, don't you know we did that? No wonder Yahweh said, I had took no notice of it. He says in, in the middle of verse 4, you shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. See, then they would tell people they were fasting. You know, when the Pharisees prayed, brothers and sisters, especially at times of their mourning, they would stand on a street, a, a, a crossroads. So that this, is, this is what the authorities tell us that the practice was. They'd stand on a crossroads so that people from every direction, north, south, east and west, would see them there. They'd stand out in the open so they could be seen and they had devised a, a, a code of movement by moving their body this way or that way or using the hands here or there or whatever. They had devised a code whereby they could signal with the, with the physical movements of their body what they were saying so that people would stand there and interpret them. I thank thee, Lord, that I'm not like these miserable sinners. I've done this and I've done everything else. And they would signal that by their body movements. That's how it got. It got to that low. This, says, says that, said Yahweh, is no fast to me. Is that a fast, he said, in verse 5, is such a fast that I've chosen? Is it? Is it for a day to man to afflict his soul? 
Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Would you call that a fast, acceptable day of Yahweh, would you? Well, of course, all of this came, didn't it? Because uh, they were mourning because of their misfortunes. And they were confessing that their misfortunes were because of their sins. Well, the, the answers, the answer, they didn't have to ask God. The answer's obvious. Is not this the fast that I've chosen? What is it? To loose the bands of wickedness. To undo the heavy burdens. Do you let the oppressed go free? And that you break every yoke? Look at the list of things there. Bands of wickedness, heavy burdens, the oppressed go free, break every yoke. You've read about just about every one of those things in the New Testament. They kept the people in the bonds of wickedness because they blinded them to the truth. The key, they took away the key of knowledge and locked them up, didn't they? They took away the key of knowledge. They had the, the Bible in their hand, that they were the, the ordained by the Lord to teach that. And they taught error, and all they taught was their own goodness, and they had locked their people up in sin. They didn't undo the heavy burdens. They complained when people were healed by the Lord, and when they picked up their bed, they complained about breaking the Sabbath. When the poor fellow, one case there, 38 years of that, happened on the Sabbath day, and they complained that it was done on the Sabbath day. That wasn't letting the oppressed go free and lift heavy burdens. And Jesus came upon a woman, bowed down for 18 years, like, a, like an oxen under a yoke, bowed down, couldn't, couldn't straighten her body. And he called her a daughter of Abraham. And he healed her and she stood erect. When those people, by their very teaching, were going to have her in that condition right up to the day of her death. Yahweh says, you call that a fast? Is that your definition of a fast? He says, not mine. Here it is, here's what you've got to do. Deal your bread to the hungry. Bring the poor that are cast out to your house. You listening, brothers and sisters? I get a real guilty tinge when I read things like that. Deal your bread to the hungry? We might do that to our friends, our family. What about the hungry? We bring the poor that are cast out into our house. Who do we invite home for lunch or whatever? Where do we go and at dinner at night and with what people? I must confess, I haven't eaten with too many poor people. You see, the naked, they'll cover him, people who can hardly have enough money to get clothes. And you don't hide yourself from your own flesh. You don't go out of your way to dodge them because you don't like that responsibility. When it confronts you, it's, it's confronting, isn't it? You get confronted with that and you, you don't want to be confronted with that because you get a bit of a conscience prick. You think, oh, I'll walk around and get out of the way. A am I striking a chord with, with your brothers and sisters? Because none of us are perfect. There, there may be people in our meeting who do all those things. Some I know, I think they do. But I don't do all those things. But we try to do some things. We hope God is merciful. It, it, you see, God says, you do that, look what happens to you fast. Light breaks forth as the morning. It's like getting out of bed. And it's a beautiful day. Light enlightens all your world, all about you, because you've done those things. Your health springs back. You feel on top of the world. You've got one of those, you know, elated feelings that come very seldom in old age, but in youthfulness and in old age even some days, you get out of bed and you think you could, you could wrestle with giants. You, you, you reckon you could do anything. You feel great. This, this is what doing what Yahweh says will do for you, he says. He says, your health will spring forth speedily. It won't, won't be slow. 
and thy righteousness shall go before thee, and the glory of Yahweh shall be your rear reward. You'll have a cloud in front of you and a cloud behind you by day and a pillar of fire and a pillar of fire by night. You'll walk through this world, brothers and sisters, covered in, by Yahweh of hosts, protected, promised the world to come forever and ever and ever. He said, this is, what, this is how you overcome your fast. You, it's not a question of saying, do I fast or don't I fast? It says you're fasting because of what you did wrong. Just do the right thing. They don't have to say, oh, yes or no. Just do the thing, the opposite of what you got you in the trouble, isn't it? Isn't that true, brothers and sisters? You've been through mournful occasions, haven't you? You've had unhappiness. You, you've been tossed and turning on your bed because you've either done something or thought something that's pretty bad and you, you, you feel rotten about it. And, and you wonder how on earth you, you, you'd ever be forgiven and you, you pray and you, you don't feel much better until you learn not to do it. And not only that, do the opposite. That's the antidote. Go and do something positive in the truth. So when you're in those situations, the answer of Yahweh, he doesn't have to say yes or no, whether you do or you don't. The answer is so obvious. Why am I in this situation? Because of my stupid self. That's why I'm here, because of my stupid self has put myself in a, in a slough of despond. How do I get out of that? Prayer, yes, prayer, but that's not going to help either if we don't shake ourselves and say, what can I do that's genuine and positive and doesn't make for the glorification of self and that no one else knows about and is not very, uh, you know, attractive to do it until you do it. That's what Isaiah is saying. <laughs> Yahweh says, you do that and you won't have a fast. I won't have to give you an answer. See, it, it, it's, it is, brothers and sisters, in a sense, so simple. But of course, it, it's, it's not so simple to do. Now, why did Yahweh mention the seventh month when they didn't. You see, they said, one question was, should we continue with the seventh month? Whereas the fifth month, rather, which was, of course, the destruction of Jerusalem. But the seventh month was that incident with Ishmael and, and Gedaliah, when Ish Gedaliah was put in charge of the little, little group of Jews. Now, I think I, I never, ever can read this section. I often say to Vern when we read it, she's probably sick of hearing me say it, I say, you know, love, this is a tragic situation. It is a, a, a tragic situation. And you know what happened? Nebuchadnezzar said, leave Nehemiah, give him a choice, to Jeremiah rather, to give, give Jeremiah a choice to come or go. He, he could come to Babylon, we'll look after him. If he doesn't want to, we'll look after him where he is. He's been one that's been trying to get these people to surrender to us. We appreciate that. And he did it, of course, not for their, their benefit. He, he did it because Yahweh told him to do it. But they, they interpreted that as being to the, uh, you know, a bit on their side in that sense, and they were prepared to help Jeremiah. He chose wisely. He said, no, I will stay with my people. Now, you think of the opportunity they had. Who were they? You just think of this. The whole land is denuded of, of its inhabitants. They're all dragged away. Now, here's Jerusalem. Here's the land laying with very few people left in it. Who's left in it? All the poor class. People who've nothing. People that probably just had a little plot of land to put their tent on and that was about all. You read about it. And that's what happened. And they, they, they appoint Gedaliah as the governor to represent the people to Babylon. They said, now, if you obey yourself, be good boys and girls and in the land and we, we, we won't worry you and we'll, we'll support you. That's what they did. And Jeremiah is among them. Now, what a glorious opportunity. And they were invited, brothers and sisters, to walk into the farmlands that had been left destitute, walk in without cash or anything, and claim those places. They could have a farm with animals, buildings, everything, overnight, for nothing, until this idiot, Ishmael, went over to his mate over in the Ammonites and made a deal with them and come back and slew Gedaliah. And not only get a liar, but the fools went and killed some of the Babylonian guards that had been left there. And when he, to when he tore off, the people chased him, they lost his sight of him, and he got away. Then all the people said, oh, we're in trouble big time. 
We're in trouble big time. This is what the seventh month feast was about. They're in big trouble over what's happened. You know what we'll do? We'll go and ask Yahweh what we'll do. Now you turn to Jeremiah 42. This is why Yahweh raises the seventh month. It's a classic illustration of why these people are here from Bethel. They, they didn't mention the seventh month. God did. Now here's what happened. Chapter 42 of Jeremiah. Just follow this with me. We won't read all the verses. We'll just pick out the, the relevant ones. Chapter 42, verse 1 says, And all the captains of the forces, Johanan the son of Korea, and Jezaniah the son of Hoshabiah, and all the people from the least even unto the greatest came near, and said unto Jeremiah the prophet, let we, let we beseech you our supplication be accepted before thee, and pray for us unto Yahweh thy God, even for all this remnant, for we are left but a few of many, as thine eyes do behold us this day that Yahweh thy God may show us the way. We want to know the way, Jeremiah. You, you, you're, you're in touch with Yahweh. He loves you. You pray and you are, he'll tell you. They must, we want to know the way where we're going to walk and the thing we've got to do. So they're going to ask this question, you see. And then verse 6, they said, whether it be good or, or whether it be evil, we, we will obey the voice of Yahweh. We'll do it. it, it whether, whether we think it's right or wrong, good or evil, we will do what we're told. We will obey the voice of Yahweh to whom we send thee, that it may be well with us when we obey the voice of Yahweh. Jeremiah said, give me ten days. The next verse says that. Ten days to consider that. After that ten days, they came back. Verse 10. If you will still abide in this land, then I will build you and not pull you down, and I will plant you and not pluck you up. For I repent me of the evil which I have done unto you. This is the answer of Yahweh. Stay here. But if you say, we will not dwell in this land, neither will we obey the voice of Yahweh our God, saying, no, but we will go into the land of Egypt, where we will see no war, nor hear the sound of the trumpet, nor have any hunger of bread, and there we will dwell. And now therefore hear the word of Yahweh, ye remnant of Judah. Thus saith Yahweh of armies, the God of Israel, if ye wholly set your faces to enter into Egypt and to go and sojourn there, then it shall come to pass that the sword which ye feared will overtake you there in the land of Egypt, and the famine whereof ye were afraid shall follow close after you in Egypt, and there you'll die. That's your answer. Clear as crystal. So after ten days they come back. They said, now whatever you say, Jeremiah, whatever you say, whether we good or evil, Mate, I'm telling you, sincerely, we'll do it, we'll do it, whatever you say, doesn't matter whether we approve or don't approve. I say we stay. Verse chapter 43. And it came to pass that when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking unto all the people all the words of Yahweh their God, for which Yahweh their God had sent him to them, even all these words, then spake Azariah, the son of Hoshabiah, and Johanna the son of Korea, and all the proud men, Saying unto Jeremiah, you're telling lies. You speak falsely. Yahweh our God hath not sent thee to say, go not into Egypt to sojourn there. But Barak, the son of Neriah, setteth thee on against us for to deliver us into the hand of the Chaldeans that they might put us to death and carry us away captives into Babylon. You're telling lies, Jeremiah. You got your mate Barak in your ear. You probably want to stop here for your own gain. We don't believe you. We reckon the Babylonians, when they hear about this fellow Ishmael killing some of their own men, we're history. We're off. That's why Yahweh mentioned the seventh month, because that's exactly what these fellows from Bethel had come about. Come with all the goodwill in the world, oozing out of them. To do whatever Yahweh said, providing it's what they wanted. And that, brothers and sisters, is a basic human failing in you and me. It is a basic human fail in all of us. We will do anything as long as it suits us. But when it doesn't suit us, we won't do it even though we're told to do it. That, that is human nature to a T. That's why Yahweh mentioned the seventh month, because it was a classic illustration 
of what those men of Bedford were all about. A classic illustration of it. You couldn't get a better illustration than the case of Ishmael. Having slain, and get alive, by the way, was a wonderful fellow. He was probably not an important man of Israel. If he had been, he'd have been taken into Babylon. He was down the ranks a bit. But the Babylonians appointed him and he was a good-hearted man. He, he wouldn't even believe evil about Ishmael. When they warned him about Ishmael, he said, no, no, he's not, he's not like that. He's not, really, he's not really a bad chap at all. He, he was one of those people. He was a lovely person. But, but of course, he was, he was naive and it cost him his life. And now these people are going to do everything that Yahweh says, providing, of course, it suited them. That's why Yahweh mentioned the seventh month, because that's exactly what this crowd had come to Jerusalem for. You see, Yahweh reads our hearts and minds, brothers and sisters. He reads our hearts and minds. And Yahweh's answer to them is this, back, back in, in Zechariah chapter 7. His answer to this, not their answer to the original question, because that doesn't get answered until later. But back in chapter 8 here, his, his, his answer to them, is, is in chapter 7 rather, his answer in verse 9 is this, Thus speaketh Yahweh of armies. Now here comes his answer. What are they going to do? Well, he, he doesn't mention whether they keep feasts or not, does he? doesn't have to. Because he says, Thus speaketh Yahweh of armies, verse 8, saying, Execute true judgment and show mercy and compassion every man to his brother. Okay? Now, those words should have rung a bell. Although they may not have been in Jerusalem at the time of the coronation of Joshua, it would be big news. There was big celebrations when they crowned Joshua, the high priest of Israel, as king also was a symbolic thing, of course, we know, because the Lord didn't permit that. But he was a man who was going to be a king priest and the council of peace between them both. And they would all know, or they should have known, what the king stood for was to execute true judgment. And they knew what the priest was for, to show mercy and compassion to every man to his brother. And though Yahweh knows full well that none of us ever get that right, perfectly right, that is, we try, but we never really get it perfectly right. That's the, that's the hallmark. We've got to aim for that, don't we? So what he was saying, in effect, to them was this. To put it in the vernacular, he says, Now, thus speaketh Yahweh of armies, imitate Jesus Christ in your life. That's what he was saying. Joshua is Jesus' name in the Hebrew. Jesus is now a king and a priest. At the right hand of the Father, our mediator. We want to know our way through our problems. Imitate the man at my right hand. Execute true judgment and show mercy and compassion to every man to his brother. Because he's a priest after the order of Melchizedek, who was king of Salem. First righteousness and after that peaceable. First executing true judgment. And after that executing compassion, showing compassion and mercy to your brethren. If we get that as close as we can, brothers and sisters, fast go out the window. That's what God's telling them. And they would know, wouldn't they? They, they would know full well that those circumstances were all just enacted in chapter, in chapter 6 just before they got there. That those things were portrayed in that ceremony of the coronation of Joshua. And certain things were said there. They didn't have to ask what the meaning. Yahweh said he will be a king upon his throne. He'll be a priest and the council of peace be between them both. You want peace? Well, there they are. There's the two principles. Judge, right judgment and mercy. Try and get them together. That's your answer. Whether they keep the feast or not, not yes or no, that's the answer, brothers and sisters. And then he says in verse 10, oppress not the widow. Now you see, this is what it's all about, isn't it? Oppress not the widow, he says in, in chapter 7 and verse 10. Oppress not the widow, the fatherless, the stranger, the poor, and let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. Well, we know, brothers and sisters, that Oh, that's that quotation from Isaiah, which we'll read at any rate. Now, he said, did you hear the words of the... Before we get there, that's what, I forgot this. Did you hear the words of the former prophets? You see, did, have they heard the words of the former prophets? What did the former prophets say? Be not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith Yahweh of armies, Turn now for your evil ways and for your evil doings. But they did not hear, nor hearken unto me. That's in Zechariah chapter 1. Since the father 
others came forth out of the land of Egypt under this day. I have even sent unto you all my servants the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. You didn't hearken unto me, nor inclined their ear, but hardened their neck. They did worse than their fathers. We're going to see that same list in this. We have sinned and committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from the precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants the prophets, which spoke in the name of our kings, our princes, our fathers, and to all the people of the land. Daniel chapter 9. For many years didst thou forbear them and testified against them by their spirit in the prophets, yet they would not give ear, neither gavest thou them into the hand of the people of the lands. And lastly, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. It wouldn't matter what age, you went back in the Old Testament, brothers and sisters, the message was the same. Listen to your pioneers. That message is repeated over and over. That's only a sample of literally dozens of references like that. That's the problem, isn't it? The truth came alive, didn't it? Back in the 1800s with Brother Thomas, out of a fog of mystery and iniquity and all sorts of blasphemous views about the Bible, a man emerged with a Bible in his hand by sheer dint of perseverance and hard work as a Bible student, didn't have the Holy Spirit or anything like that, he just read the Bible and uncovered for the first time in, 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 our, in, our, in our era, brothers and sisters, the light of the morning. We saw it. And as the years go on, we're hearing less and less about that. Less and less. And the message of God was, listen to your former prophets. Listen to them. And as Brother Des said from this platform once, Every reformation, successful reformation in, the, in Israel was a reference back to the past. Show me something different. That's a big lesson, brothers and sisters. And there are things done today which you, you shake your head and you think, Brother Thomas, Brother Roberts, Brother Carter and, and those that followed him would never have made such decisions as being made today. Never. But people forgot that. And this is what happened to this crowd. They forgot that, brothers and sisters. Pure and undefiled religion before God. This is what they had to practice. Pure and undefiled religion before God, it says here. Oppress not the, the widow, the stranger, the fatherless and your, and your brother. You see, James says, pure and undefiled religion before God is this, to visit the fatherless and, and widows in their affliction and to keep yourself unspotted from the world. Now, some people quote that as if that was the whole thing, the whole truth. It is morally, but it, it, it's not, James is not saying that we ignore doctrine and just do good work. He's not saying that. What he's saying to these people, because they had an outward show of religion, they stood at street corners when they prayed. They covered their head with ashes and made out they were fasting and suffering. They did all these things for show. James' point is that true religion shows itself in a way of life. It's the doctrines which, of course, become the motive force and they show themselves in, in, a, in a way of life. And that's what he says in James chapter 1. And this is what Zechariah is saying. Oppress not the widow, the fatherless, nor the, nor the, the, the poor. And so we look, read these verse. And a sojourner shall tread down, and a sojourner shalt thou not tread down, neither shalt thou drive him away. For sojourners ye became in the land of Egypt, neither widow nor fatherless shalt thou humiliate. They're not allowed to do that. The needy will not cease out of the midst of the land. For this cause am I com have I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt open thine hand unto thy brother, to the poor and to the needy in thy land. Very plain. Deuteronomy. Let none of you imagine evil against his brother. How long will ye imagine mischief against a man? You shall be slain, all of you. As a bowing wall shall ye, shall ye be, and as a tottering fence. Though I have bound and strengthened their arms, yet do they imagine mischiefs against me. Says Hosea. 
Woe to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. When the morning light they practice it because it is in the power of their hand to do so. Now, brothers and sisters, I'll tell you one place where that was not done. Where the poor and the stranger and the needy were totally neglected. Guess where? Guess where? Bethel. Bethel was noted for that very thing. And this is the crowd that's coming to ask Yahweh, should we stop fasting? Now I'll show you. First of all, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 14. This is a wonderful thing. Let's have a look at this. We go to Deuteronomy chapter 14. And what do we read in the last, three, the last two verses of that chapter? It's not the only place it's mentioned. It's mentioned again in Deuteronomy. You would have read it a few days ago. But in the 14th chapter of Deuteronomy, beginning at verse 28, it says this. At the end of three years thou shalt bring forth all the tithe of thine increase, the tithe of the same year, and shall lay it up within thy gates. And the Levite, because he hath no part nor inheritance with thee, and the stranger, and the fatherless, and the widow, which are within thy gates, shall come and shall eat and be satisfied, that Yahweh thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hand which thou doest. Now let me explain that. What is this tithe of three years? Well, you see, what happened? Take the ordinary year of tithing. So you're a farmer and you live perhaps a fair distance from Jerusalem or you may live near. But you've got to make an assessment at the end of that year, that in the, uh, at the end of that agricultural year, in the seventh month, you make an assessment of what, you, what, what your produce was uh, in terms of produce and, and the fruits and so forth and the, the cattle and all that you had. You had to make an assessment and you had to give a tenth of that to Yahweh. And you had to come to Jerusalem, no matter where you lived. You could not just give it to the priest next door or the Levite, no way. You've got to go down to Jerusalem. If you live a long way away, I'm quoting the law now, if you live, this is not Jewish tradition, it's in Leviticus, if you lived a long way away, what you did, you turned those, those goods into money and you carried that down with you. Because you couldn't take all the sheep or goats or cattle and all those things. You'd have to make an assessment of the value and then you'd take that down to Jerusalem and give it to the priest. But before you did that, you bought the equivalent when you got there. You bought your animals and so forth and your wheat and your corn with that money and you changed it back again into, into uh, material things and you gave that to the priest. Now, you didn't lose all of it. You didn't lose all of it. You were invited then to sit down with the priest and the Levites and share part of that, that, that tent. It would be a very small part, of course, out of one meal, basically. And you sat down with them and they shared that meal with you. So you shared it with God's representative, the priest, and with the workers that helped him, the Levites. That's what you did. Now Yahweh said, it's a long way, isn't it? It is a long way. You come down from up the north or the south, east or west, it's a long way. Well, I'll tell you what. You don't have to do that in the third year. On this condition. That when you sit down and eat that tithe, and it's yours for that third year, then you have everybody that can't afford anything, the poor, the stranger, the widow, and the fatherless, and the Levite, because he has got an inheritance. I want you to fill your house and invite every poor brother and sister in Israel. I want in a house during that weekend when you have that feast and to share it with them. You do that and you don't have to come there and share it with me. Now, that, that is transparent, the meaning of that, isn't it? That is absolutely transparent. We come here every Sunday morning and we eat a little bit of bread and we drink a little bit of wine and we are actually sharing a feast that was prepared by Yahweh and the feast was his son. He was the sacrifice. We are coming here to eat that little bit of bread and wine and to complement that great sacrifice on this table, what it really meant to us and what was done on our behalf. And the lesson, brothers and sisters, is that God is saying to us, I want you to go home into your house and to do what I have just done with you Sunday morning. When you sit in your chair and you just look at that bit of bread in your hand or your little bit of wine about this big, you look at that and you count that up in terms of what, what a tithe would mean, the measure of the whole lot, 
you got in, in your hand, brothers and sisters, six hours of scorching agony. You got in your hand 33 years of a life of intensity where you do nothing wrong, you think nothing wrong, you say nothing wrong. For 33 years. And that little misly bread and little bit of wine that you got represents that. Now Yahweh says, you go out of this hall. I want to see that practiced in your house. That's what that means. Now it wasn't done in Bethel. Amos 4. That's why Yahweh mentions it like he does. Because this crowd came from a city famous for not doing this. And here's what they were doing. Hear this word, ye kind of Bashan. Now, kind is a, a, a female cow. It's a cow. All cows are female. It's a cow. And they're a Bashan because that was the most wonderful grazing land you could have cattle. Yeah, Ephraim, Manasseh, and, and uh, Reuben, and Gad, they, they, they believed that. They were settled in the land because of that. This is not Bashan. They're called that because they're, they're big, fat women. They're in the mountain of Samaria. That's where they are, just north of, of Israel, just north of Judah, which oppressed the poor. They crushed the needy, which say to their masters, and by the word, the word Baal there, Baal means either a lord or a master or a husband, and most, a lot of cases it's rendered as it should be there. They say to their husbands, bring and let us drink. So here they are, ensconced in these magnificent mansions up there in Samaria. Big fat women that just do nothing but eat stuff all day long and they've got servants work working for them. And when they sit there, they say to their husband, listen, darling, bring me another drink, will you please? And God says, what are you doing? He says, verse 3, he's, he, verse 2, and yeah, let... And the Lord Yahweh has sworn by his holiness that lo, the day shall come upon you that he will take you away with hooks and your posterity with fish hooks and ye shall go out at the breaches every cow at that which is before her and ye shall cast them into the palace, saith Yahweh. Come to Bethel. This is where it's done. Come to Bethel and transgress. To Gilgal, multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning and your tithe after three years. See the point, brothers and sisters? Your tithe after three years. Come and do that, says Yahweh. And offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with, with leaven and proclaim and publish the free offerings. For this liking you, O children of Israel, saith the Lord Yahweh. And so on and so on. Here they were, brothers and sisters, crushing the needy, robbing the poor, and having the audacity to bring the year of third tithe to Bethel in recognition of their wonderful worship for Yahweh, the God of Israel. When that law was given for the express reason and condition that you could only do that if you invited all the poor people into your house and looked after them. And they come to Bethel to do that. You see what this prophecy is on about, brothers and sisters. Well, coming back as we finish Zechariah chapter 7. And of course, by the time we finish chapter 7, we still haven't got their answer to their, to their question, have we? Well, we have in part, but we haven't got it all yet. So back in chapter 7, verse 11 says, they refused to hearken. They wouldn't pay attention, says the, the NIV. They pulled away the shoulder. They turned their backs. They stopped their ears. They didn't want to hear. They don't want to listen. And their hearts were like a diamond. Adamant stone. He, the ESV says diamond heart. That's the sort of people, brothers and sisters. They wouldn't pay attention. Go to the meetings. Peer here and, you know... Make sure everybody sees you here. Can't wait till the brother finishes. Because we've got to get home. For whatever reason. Obligations come upon us, brothers and sisters, to do this or that. I'll ask brother so-and-so. 
Five sister sunset. We just turn our back and walk away. You, I, I don't think you do this. I'm just saying, search your own heart. Stop your ears. Don't want to hear certain things because they're too negative. That's a catch cry today. Got to be positive. Got to be positive. Got to be positive. How much positivity you reckon's in the prophets from Isaiah to Malachi? I'd guess around about 10%. But if we hear anything negative, we don't want to know it. We don't want to talk about that. Might be a warning, but, well, who, that's about other people. Our heart is like a stone. This is what they're doing at Bethel, isn't it? Amos says this went on at Bethel when they come there to keep the third year tithe. Well, brothers and sisters, it's all summarised, and we'll summarise tonight of Yahweh's attitude in the Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 1. All that we read there, it's all summarised here. Proverbs chapter 1. From verse 24 to 28. Yahweh said, I won't hear them. That's what he said in Zechariah. I'm not going to listen. Proverbs 1 verse 24. Because I have called and ye refused, I've stretched out my hand and no man regarded, but ye have said it, Lord, all my counsel and with none of my reproof. I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me early, but they will not find me. And they didn't, did they? And they found out that for 70 years, Yahweh had turned his back on them, didn't hear them, didn't want to hear them. And they're not going to get their answer, brothers and sisters, until we come to the end of chapter 8. It's going to be the same answer. The answer is very simple. Do the opposite to what you're doing. To, when you celebrate your fast, do the opposite of what, what you're doing it for to celebrate. You're celebrating your sin, just do the opposite. You don't have to be told, oh, we don't do it next month. No, no, just, just, just change your ways. It's as simple as that. But, of course, simple things are very hard to absorb, aren't they? And, very hard to practice and, and that's what makes life so difficult. But brothers and sisters, we're all facing that sort of thing. We're going to Jerusalem, to the priest. Not as a delegation, we're going to be taken there. But we're going to go through that same process, aren't we? It's all going to come down to a question of motive, isn't it? It's all going to come down to that. And when you read chapters like that 7th and 8th chapter of Zechariah, it's a very sobering thing. Pray God that we can go there as Heldiah, Tobijah, Shechaniah did, brothers of Je Jediah did, men that's come out of the world, women that's come out of the world. God knows them and he'll be good to us. <laughs>